Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Well, today we are incredibly fortunate to have two distinguished alumni back here with us today uh, to share a little bit about their paths since leaving Tepper. And uh, they also are providing us with a poignant reminder of all the importance of the things that happen outside the classroom here as well as Anne-Marie Pitak and Patricia Little were actually roommates and close friends here at Tepper. Um, so we will hear, hear from them today about their story and their paths from Tepper. And um, I'd just like to provide a brief bio about each of the women, but we'll talk in more at greater length about their experiences. Um, Anne-Marie is Senior Managing Director and the Chief Financial Officer of BlackRock. Prior to joining BlackRock, she was uh, Vice President and Treasurer at Ford. And um, during her time at Ford, she also spent time in Brazil and Europe. She has a bachelor's degree from Muhlenberg and her MBA from Tepper. And Patricia Little is currently Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Kelly Services. Prior to joining Kelly Services, she also was at Ford as uh, a general auditor. And during her time at Ford, she also played a major role in several major acquisitions. She has uh, a bachelor's degree from Drake University and also her MBA from Tepper. So please join me in welcoming these two women back to campus today. Thank you. Um, well, so I think a good place to start um, would be to ask each of you sort of what brought you to Tepper. Well, it's interesting because when we were graduating, it was from undergraduate school. Um, it was 1982, and the economy wasn't exactly booming. And um, I, was, I had been a business major and Spanish undergrad, really knew I loved and wanted to pursue a business career. But I also was figuring out what I wanted to do with my life and um, applied for the Peace Corps. And actually, Tepper was much more efficient. So gave me an offer of you know coming, the Carnegie Mellon was um, more efficient. And the Peace Corps process was very elongated. So I had to do, sort of decide yes or no coming here. And um, given the opportunity, I decided to come here. It was... Uh, and one of those things that's a fork in the road that you never look back. Very similar for me. I was graduating with a degree in accounting. Uh, again, the economy wasn't that robust. I also knew I didn't um, want to work at, this shows you how old I am, it was the big eight then, accounting firms. It was <laughs> really interesting. See, I made a good choice. And uh, so I applied to a number of schools. I liked Tepper because of the focus on quantitative. That really suited me, and that was really the differentiator for me uh, and why I came here. Sure. Reasons that I, I think, think are still relevant, yeah, and probably the reason for many here today. Well, then how is it that the two of you actually met at Tepper? I remember. I mean, we, so I don't know if they still do this, but it was like the second day, and we all came to this room, and they, it wasn't this room, but it was the big auditorium, and they basically spent like three hours really scaring us and telling us how hard it was going to be, and we were going to flunk out, and it was just going to be the hardest thing you've ever had in your whole life, and it was just going to be dreadful, and we, we both, we probably sat next to each other, so we started walking back to Shadyside together, because we both had um, apartments there, and we said, ah, oh, this is... This is nonsense. Let's go have fun. <laughs> Let's work on our social networking skills, is I think how we put it. Yeah, yeah that, that was And then the second it. year, we, we started a room together. Yeah, yeah. The second year, we roomed together. I, I, it would have been fortuitous had we the first year. Because yes, that would have worked out even yeah. better. Aw. Um, well, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I think it's nice to hear reminders of the importance of everything that's not in the classroom as well. And I guess one other quick question to ask each of you before we move on from the Tepper questions. Do um, either of you have sort of a favorite class or something that, um, you know, having moved on in your career, lessons from a certain class that, you know, seem particularly helpful? 
for me, it was less about one single class and more about um, the pace and the tools that you had here. And so whether it was game or the mini system, um, just a continuous um, pace of change and a lot compressed into little periods, I think very much replicates uh, what you end up facing in real life. Um, and that need to prioritize is one of the things that you really walk away with from here. Um, and then I appreciated also, going back to that theme, that this was really a skills-based program, not a you know, case study only program, and that you were learning hard skills that you could then bring and apply with you. When we were here, uh, TEPRA was absolutely the cutting edge of working, having you do a lot of your work in groups. Uh, the other comparable programs were all still very, very individually based. And that, to me, is something that when I look back, you know, you just don't accomplish anything in your day without working through people. And I feel like I learned the most from the other students around me and what Tepper did was gave me the environment where that was possible, as opposed to having the sort of one-way learning from professor to student. They really figured out the secret to ha making you learn from all the people around you. And that's what you and I do every single day. Yeah. Um, so I think that has stayed with me as the biggest single thing I got out of the program. Absolutely. Well, and so I you know, gave a brief bio, but I think uh, it might also be helpful for us to hear from your perspective, um, how did each of your careers develop from sitting in these halls at Tepper to where you are now? And maybe if you could also highlight if there were pivotal, pivotal moments or interactions, decisions you made um, along the way. Yeah, it's a very um, extremely similar story. So we both graduated from Tepper. We both took jobs at Ford Motor Company. Um, and we both started what Ford has, which is the advantage of being an extremely large global company uh, with a rotational program. So you go and you work in treasury and you work in accounting and you work in business support and you work in the credit company and you work in the auto side and you work on product development and you get to do everything. And so we moved around a lot. Uh, very, very similar program. Amory had the advantage of going uh, on international assignments, which I wasn't able to do and I think that was really neat. And we just advanced through that um, process. And maybe you want to talk about the international side, because I think that was a real differentiator. Yeah, it, you know, it's very funny when you start to work at a place, you just, um, you really start looking usually at something quite micro. And, um, you know, you're doing these spreadsheets and other things. and. and but through all of that, you're learning a lot about the firm. And in a place that is big and complex like Ford, um, what going international gave you the opportunity to do was be in a smaller pond but a bigger fish. Because you could look at a whole business, whereas when you were sitting at headquarters, you were always looking at a tiny piece of a very large business. And so what those types of opportunities, whether they're overseas subsidiaries or domestic subsidiaries, but a willingness to go sit in a smaller pond um, gives you the opportunity to develop breadth as well as depth. And for me, that was a um, really important part of the career development. I don't remember any um, really complete pivotal moments because it's a series of small decisions that you make. But I, I often think careers tend to break down into, this is a little artificial, but kind of thirds. And the first third, you really spend, and I, I think of it as a buffet, and you want to sample a lot and do a lot of variety and figure, you know, just expose yourself to as many experiences and opportunities as you can. And then sort of in the middle, you really need to step back and look and say, OK, what did I learn about myself? You know, I'm an individualist. Nobody's ever going to give you a cookie cutter career and tell you this is the path to success. You have to know what your strengths are, what you like to do, because you're always going to do a much better job at the stuff you like to do. You need to be able to say what that is and say what it isn't, which is actually the harder part. You know, I ask this question of people all the time in the middle part of their career, and they can give me a, a long list of the things they want to do. And then I say, OK, what don't you want to do? And, that's harder to articulate, but often more revealing. 
And then I think the last third of your career, you need to take all of that and leverage it. And that's when you're probably going to be really moving, um, hopefully, at a very fast pace, because you are now have a lot of experiences. You know what you want to accomplish, and you've developed the skills to do it. So I think of it in sort of those chunks. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we were lucky that we spent 20 years at a place like Ford that gave us the chance to do all of those and still stay at the same company, which is pretty rare. I, I would say what um, you'd think I would have learned the first time, but it took me a couple experiences, and maybe I still haven't learned it. But a couple of pivotal moments in my career came about um, by happenstance. Um, one was the first was the opportunity to go to work down in Brazil. And that came about by someone in the division I used to work for um, that I worked very hard to get out of that division because I really wanted a change in my career. I was the last one promoted being in that yeah. division of all the people, the six of us went to um, Ford and I was really lagging in my career compared to everyone else. So I worked hard to get out of this division. Actually, Patricia um, helped to advocate for me um, joining headquarters. And then this opportunity came up uh, they called me and they said, would you come work for the division again in Brazil? And I really wanted to go to Brazil. And I thought, but I, now I was in treasury doing what I really loved doing. And so I had the job I wanted, but I wanted to go. So I went and talked to the assistant treasurer, who was ultimately the treasurer and uh, advocate and mentor for both Patricia and I over the years. And I said, Mac, I'd really like to go to Brazil. And I've been given this offer. I don't know what to do. And he said, you'd go to Brazil, Anne-Marie? I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, don't take the job. I'll get you the job you want. And um, I didn't take the job. And you know, sure enough, about three months later, um, I had the role of deputy treasurer for a huge joint venture between Volkswagen and Ford um, <laughs> in Brazil, looking over Brazil and Argentina. So what I learned then, and you think I would have learned this lesson, is if you don't tell people yeah, I know. what you want, <laughs> what you want, they're never going to guess. And yes. people make a lot of it's people make true. a lot of assumptions about you. Um, and it's funny because a very similar path took me to BlackRock, where. I, about a year before I ever joined BlackRock, I ended up with a job offer to go somewhere else because I was really ready for a career change. And I called Larry Fink, who I knew well already for about 10 years. Yeah. Both Patricia and I did because we worked together overseeing the pension funds, 70 billion for Ford, and BlackRock was one of our key pension fund managers. And I called Larry and I said, what do you think of this job opportunity? He said, you would leave Ford? And I said, yeah, I, I'm planning to do it. And um, I said, I just need to find the right thing. And sure enough, a year later, um, he said, well, will you come work to me? And, and so again, that same lesson that it, if people don't really know you um, and what you're looking for, it, it's really, they make a lot of assumptions about who you are that may or may not be true. So I think pivotal move, moments in my career came from exposing what I really wanted. Um, and then actually people want to fulfill your want. Yeah. And it's funny because as you were telling that, I was remembering the reason I'm at Kelly Services is because a, a recruiter called Anne Marie and she said, well, I know who you should call. You should call Patricia. And then she <laughs> called me up right away. I said, OK, I just gave your name to this recruiter. And then two minutes later, that phone rang. And you know, So that's how I ended up there, because Anne Marie knew that I was looking for a change as well. So you, I think that's absolutely right. I, I like that way of thinking about it, that it's a series of decisions over a long time, knowing yourself, so knowing what it is you like, and then yeah. you can articulate it, ask for it. And also, that's so nice, the theme already emerging and how you each were able to advocate and help each other. So we definitely, later on, will return to some more questions about sort of networking and um, the power of networks. Um, and we touched on this a little bit earlier and just what was your favorite class, takeaways from Tepper, but um, are there any other um, skills or things that you feel Tepper helped to really equip you uh, to meet these opportunities in your career with success? I, 
you know, I, I think the skills are less the specific, you know, I learned this formula in this class, but it's those critical thinking skills. And I continue to be quite a quantitative person um, and in a firm that highly <laughs> It values, quant I mean, there's a lot of quantitative people in the firm. I co-chair with um, a PhD from MIT in math, um, our risk committee. But, you know, it, it's just a lot of people that think in that very critical analytic way. And I feel like that's been a really good foundation of rational thinking and decision making. I, I would like to say thank you to Tepper because actually when Anne-Marie and I went to Tepper, it was not as highly rated in the um, stats. And so, but now we get all the benefits of the <laughs> that people say, wow, you went to Carnegie Mellon. You know, so it's really good. And we want to say thank you for that. I, I like free rides. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, so then sort of to switch gears a little bit, um, as the CFOs of your respective organizations, you have a huge uh, range of responsibility. Um, could you each maybe talk a little bit about uh, the impending uh, regulatory changes, financial reform, and how uh, you are having to change your organizations to meet the challenges and turn them into opportunities? I, uh, you know, first of all, when you think about the face of regulatory change and whether it's coming as regulatory change on financial services, whether it's coming from standard setters changes, so highest change in accounting standards um, that we've seen proposed changes in the role of the auditor to, out of the PCLB, um, or tax reform. All this change is coming about for a reason. Um, and the reason is in 2000 and 2000, 2008 and 2009, investors were terribly disappointed. They were let down by the management of firms. They were let down by the system of regulators. They were let down um, by people really not understanding and disclosing risk in a way that um, investors were harmed, the general public was harmed. So I think the first important thing to think about in the face of regulatory change is it's not a lot of people trying to make our life more difficult. It's actually people trying to prevent um, problems from recurring that maybe should never have occurred. Reform is being pushed for a good reason. And I feel like the responsibility then of uh, the CFO and the management of the firm is to advocate for change in a way that doesn't bring unintended consequences. There is so much going on that there are a lot of unintended consequences that may come out from the change. And I, I could cite a number of examples if we want to get into that. Um, so whether it's going to Washington, DC, whether it's going to Norwalk or to Europe to sit with those advisors, um, or whether it's advocating on the tax side, uh, your role is to, I think, be a proponent of change. Because anyone who would want to embrace no change at this time, I think, is wearing blinders, mm -hmm. but be an advocate of positive change that will have um, avoid, hopefully, the unintended consequences of such a voluminous amount of change coming um, from people who really, many of them, never worked in industry. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I see that as well. I think Anne Marie said it very well. I'll give you one small piece, which would be also then you have to interpret it for your own company, right? Because I sit around the table with people who are very, very frustrated, see it just as a lot of work, don't see the purpose, and you've got to get people past that kind of venting stage and just say, okay, but it's our reality. Let's just get on with the work and let's now focus on how we do it. And you know, you have to know your moment of when to move beyond the, the sort of just venting, you know, they're all out to get us hard. Well, one thing that's been really a fortunate seat sitting in an investment management um, company is that, I'll just use our accounting policy group, they used to work and think of us as a issuer of financial statements. 
And we totally restructured what we did, and we said, okay, we're not going to write any letters until we talk to the portfolio managers investing and using um, financial statements and what really is useful information for them. And then we're going to understand what our big clients um, think who are also affected by these standards. Because unless you're willing to have the debate internally of what is really good for someone, um, I, I clearly think two themes are very, very important, which is transparency is critically important in the financial system, and I think there will be positive change in um, that respect. Um, and I, I think that a lot of the change to protect clients in different ways is critically important. Unfortunately, some of the change yes. may unintentionally harm clients. Um, well, thank you. Um, and sort of switching gears a little bit again, um, it is so inspiring as a woman pursuing my MBA to see two female CFOs. And so wanted to ask um, whether uh, you feel that you faced uh, difficulty being women in male-dominated field, or if that actually wasn't you know, that big of an issue in your experience and maybe another issue or challenge in each of your experiences was more significant? It, you know, clearly, especially when we started at Ford, which is, you know, a big automotive, it's a very male-dominated place. There were not a lot of women. But it, I, I think I'd speak a little bit for you as well. It just wasn't how we viewed it. I mean, you, if you go through life and you see yourself as this collection of demographic facts about yourself, which, by the way, you can't change anyway, <laughs> you, you, you start to get into this mindset of defining yourself that way. and at, at worst, defining yourself a victim of those facts. And I think you open yourself up that that's how other people are going to define you. And you just walk in and you're going to do your best job. And you're not, it's not it, part of your headset. That's just at least the way it's always been for me. I didn't see it as a big disadvantage. I frankly saw advantages as often as I saw disadvantages. For one thing, you, you, um, if you have something to say, people are actually going to listen to it more because you're sort of unique. At least you, we were in many of the rooms we were in, especially 25 years ago. So you're going to have a voice. Um, and so I, that's the way it seemed to me. Uh, and you know, but, but there, are, there are, I don't want to sound cavalier that it, everybody faces difficulties in their career. And I think that many of the difficulties that women that can kind of move women off the track are also difficulties faced by men. And I think that as we move towards a world where there's more flexibility in the workforce and there's more um, sort of options out there. I think that that benefits men as well as women. Uh, I did a job share for a while, for three years, as when I was uh, working on the pension fund. And I did it. And this was at a very senior level, so essentially an executive level. And I shared this job with uh, Kathleen Gallagher. And it was wonderful. And not just because I had some um, more sleep, but because uh, we were such a good pair. And I learned from her. and I. Mm -hmm. It was actually one of the most beneficial things I ever did for my career. So I think that flexibility, and, and you guys are absolutely the inheritor of that, uh, benefits everybody. And you should take advantage of it um, in a good way. And I, but I encourage people not to sort of, it's like Anne Marie said, you know, be who you are. Don't let them, everybody make assumptions about who you are. For me, I, I think the one lesson that I, most learned is to really always reflect on what is most important to you. And it's not going to be the same um, at any moment in time. And you know whether you're a new mother or a new father at that moment in time, um, that child may be the most important thing and need extra attention, whether you have an illness in your family. So it, that could easily happen to a man or a woman that you're really true to your own priorities, so you're at peace at what you're doing. And that'll say that your trajectory may not be like this. It may be like that. And as well as you're living your own priorities, you can always be at peace. And I know I and Patricia both made a number of career decisions that were bad for our careers. And the truth is, they were not bad for our lives and um, because they were good for our lives and allowed us to perform.
they were actually good for our career. So I, my career was never harmed by one of those decisions, and I was always at peace for my, you know, with myself. So I just think it's having that. Yeah, I think that's helpful too because I think sometimes when we're here and we feel so far away, there's a lot of emphasis on like a linear path. Oh, really, no one's path is linear. <laughs> there's a lot of value in, um, you know, all the different moves. When I talk to people who are broadly speaking your age, there there is this sort of assumption that I'm going to do. You know, I can map it out. I'm going to do A and B and C and D. And if you talk to anyone our age and you say, when you were, you know, in, starting, would you have thought you'd end up here? Well, no. You know. No one would have, or the path would, is not predictable. It never will be predictable. That's why I encourage people to take a lot of opportunities, try things out, mm -hmm. take chances, see what happens. Don't fall into the trap that there's one career. And also be very suspicious when you ask someone, not suspicious, but you know, be a little thoughtful, that when you ask people for career advice, they're always going to tell you, here's what I did, it worked, so that's really good career advice. I mean, right? They just sort of replay what their life experience was. And since it worked out for them, it must be a really valid um, argument to, or a, a piece of advice. Right. And right. I don't think so. Right, right? absolutely. Uh, so our career advice, the world that we lived in, you know, starting from the mid-'80s to now, is a different world than you're going to live in. So our career advice is, frankly, you know, interesting maybe, but not uh, predictive of the experiences that you'll have. Sure, and I like your comment as well, Patricia, about the reframing of the issue that flexibility in different things at different times in your life benefits all people. It's not just a woman thing or this kind of, so I like that point. Um, well, sort of to return to um, the concept of networking and um, the strength of networks and the nonlinear paths, um, could you each uh, talk a little bit about how your friendships, and we touched on this in part, but um, has helped you um, throughout your careers and um, also comment on maybe the importance of any other networks um, outside of Tepper that you found helpful? Well, uh, your friendships are your connections. Um, so they're certainly important, for example, when I wanted to get out of a plant into headquarters, the fact that Patricia was there and knew people and could advocate for me um, was very important. I use the word advocacy, mentor, not mentoring, because I mean, I think that people that really help you in careers are not just giving you advice. And you have to understand who are the people who are going to really know you well enough and trust you well enough that they put themselves on the line for you. And I, I feel like those connections are the really important quest connections. And then the other thing that I think till this day is really hard to get um, from anyone other than a friend or your mother is really honest feedback because negative feedback is very hard to get. And I would say, I'd love to tell you, corporate America is really helpful at giving it to you so you can really continue to grow. But it's really hard. And I remember one time after uh, earnings call, um, Patricia said to me, you know, when you're answering a question, every time you answer it, you say, I think. And she said, it's weakening how you sound in your response because you you know this stuff, you don't need to preface it by I think. And no one else would have given me or gave me that feedback. And yet I feel like I became a better presenter because I had a friend who would, I didn't like hearing it at the moment, but, <laughs> <laughs> but who had the courage to tell me that and had the trust in the relationship to do that. Yeah. I'm not, I've never used the, felt like networking is something I've done particularly well, but I, I think that the value of friendships, I mean, a network to me sounds very um, artificial and, and sort of a lot of small, uh, somewhat superficial connections. Um, and what I've found that those have not provided a lot of value to me over the years. Well, and frankly, I haven't, I would say maybe that's because I haven't tended to invest in them, right? So my, my, uh, you know, what I have invested in are stronger, deeper, longer lasting friendships, real friendships, you know, like with Anne Marie. 
And those have provided by far, in a way, the value of calling up and saying, you know, oh my God, I got to do my first earnings call in half an hour, and you know, <laughs> my palms are all sweaty, and you know, or whatever it is. And you, know, you have those really honest friend conversations, not some generic network right. conversation. And but I will say that that takes investment as well. And it, what I've noticed that for a lot of people, they get into this thing where they're, they're especially. Frankly, you know, they're they're pushing hard on their career. They're married. They have two kids who are young, and there's not one minute. I mean, there's not one minute to spare for friends, and I, and especially besides kid friends, right? Which are the people who are on the soccer team, you know, sitting at the soccer <laughs> lines. But I mean, professional work-related friends, and I would encourage people to, even when times are feel very tight. To have that call, that email, um, you're driving home, call up Anne Marie and tell her how your day went. Because that investment in friendship is where you're going to get, I think, all the benefit of a, of a network. Because it's people who know you really well and people that you can be very, very honest with about what went well and what didn't go well, and what maybe you should do differently next time. So do keep investing in your friends. You know, we've been friends now for 27 years. <laughs> and um, I know this because LinkedIn just sent me an email telling me that <laughs> it was 27 years ago that, that we were at. Yeah, actually, it would be longer because, because that would have been our graduation, yeah. I think. So it's like tw almost 30 years. And um, that's. I mean, and that it's not like we've had every minute has been great, right? We've, we, you know, we've had ups and downs, and times we've talked a lot, and times we haven't talked a lot, and but we've always come back um, as a key friendship. And I have, you know, ten people that for whom that's true, and those ten people provide me more value than you know 120 people in a network. So cherish your friends; they're really, really important. Absolutely, and I think the point about investing so they're actual real relationships that you can actually get something out of. You can call someone when it's right before the earnings call. Um, absolutely. Um, well, um, I'd also like to give anyone in the audience um, the opportunity to ask a question of our guests. What is it like to prep for an early call? And what is your first one like? And how do you kind of get the learning curve and then do a better shine? Well, the first one's the hardest. <laughs> um, but uh, it's really not been consistent for me that there is one thing. And um, since I've been at BlackRock, uh, I've been through a financial crisis, um, been through the firm doubling through a major acquisition, and so been through really going from a 5,000-person firm to a 10,000-person firm. And for me, it, it, earnings release is about really, first and foremost, studying the numbers and converting them into the story. So what are they really telling about your business? And what are the key things that investors need to understand about your business? And what the data is telling you about your business going forward. Because you want people to understand, be able to understand what has happened, and you want them to be able to model the future effectively. And you want them to have everything that is material well understood. And so to me, earnings call is a storytelling opportunity um, where you can really tell everything that's going on, what the key drivers are, um, so that people can look forward and really maybe model and understand what your opportunity sets are, um, as well as what your risks or whatever unusual might be happening. And especially because of the regulatory environment, you know, it's your one shot because you have to be so careful about selective disclosure. So you really do want to get everything out there that you can. A couple of specific things that I'd mention are, if you say something incorrect in an earnings call, feel free. I, which I, I certainly have. I don't, you probably never have, but I have. I have, you know, gotten the, given the wrong number, and then I go back, right? I say, you know, five minutes ago I told John from BlackRock this and that, and I misspoke, and I, I say that because again, I want to get the record right. Um, 
it, the worst part is when they, they, they've all jammed your numbers into their model and now they want to update it. And they tend to say something to you like, well, you know what, I modeled out for three quarters that if you were to do this and this and this, and then if your tax rate did this, and if you, what would be the answer? And you're like, I have no idea. I'm sitting here in a room you know, with barely a calculator and you just you know, put it into your Excel spreadsheet and you want me to answer. So have a really good answer when they start to chase you on doing math in front of them. Uh, and then I'll tell you one funny story about earnings call because Anne-Marie did such a good job of um, talking about all the, the really difficult stuff. So when I was first doing my earnings call, what they do is typically right afterwards, the, somebody will walk in and they'll give you a list of all the people who were on the earnings call. And they looking down this list and they say, Mary Ann Little, who's Mary Ann Little? And I said, oh my God, it's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So anyway, uh, she was on the earnings call for several, and finally I called her up and I said, Mom, you know, you can listen. We, we, we keep it on the website. If you have to listen, listen afterwards. It's freaking me out <laughs> to know that my mother is listening live right now. <laughs> so she now no longer calls in. Um, did so your mom funny. ever call in? My mother has never called in. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't explain to your parents how to call in on your earnings call. That's my biggest piece of advice because it will, it will be a big distraction when you're sitting there thinking that mom and dad are listening. That's uh, well, my, my mother has never called in. I, I do rehearse ahead of time what I'm going to say. Um, and by you know close of business the night before, really there's no material information to get out. Um, and I've made my children yes. listen to me. So <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 the worst audience. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience? That was a good one. Thank you, Aubrey. Oh sure. So you're looking forward to going out the yeah, the, um, well, at Ford, you know, certainly the underlying industry was automotive, but I spent a lot of my career working in treasury. So um, throughout my treasury career, I had responsibility for funding both Ford Credit and Ford Motor Company for overseeing risk management, so currency, commodity, and interest rate risk, overseeing the $70 billion pension fund, um, defined contribution um, plan. And really, those experiences were very financial markets oriented. And so I really loved financial services in that respect. I didn't really want to go to a bank, which is a balance sheet sort of company. I, I liked a lot better asset management, which is a service model, um, because I, I felt like one of the changes I wanted when I left auto, um, first of all, it, Ford's a great firm, and the turnaround is so exciting and fantastic, and Alan Mulally's leadership just um, is, I think, you know, all America feels very proud of um, the Ford story. And the last thing I did before I left Ford was put together a big secured financing um, that really provided the liquidity that I hope was meaningful in getting through that crisis. But then I felt like it was a lot of years of downsizing, and I had achieved a lot of that experience. And I wanted to be a part of a growth firm, and I wanted to be part of a non-capital intensive business. And um, BlackRock offered both of those changes. It was a much smaller firm. Um, it was a client-oriented survey. You know, we're all about serving our clients. Um, but its intellectual capital is the only capital of the firm. You're not investing a big balance sheet. You're not subject to cycles. Um, you have to do a good job for your clients or you're not going to have them around um, for long. But it was that opportunity to be a part of a growth story. Um, and I, I feel good because I got to be a part, I feel like, of a turnaround story, at least at the front end of it, as well as part of a... Um, part of a growth story. 
Yeah, that was a good question. That was a question I had also wondered about and um, would pose to you as well, Patricia, is sort of um, how was it at all different to move from a place where you had sort of a tangible product yeah. um, and then moving to more of a professional right. services oriented firm? I missed it. Um, I, I loved working. So I spent a fair amount of my career in Treasury as well, although I had a, a sort of a wider breadth of career, less depth than Emory. Uh, and I would say one of the things that I felt like I was going to really miss when I went to Kelly, uh, where we, you know, obviously we do staffing and, and uh, talent management, is that connection to a tangible product. The, the nice thing, though, is it's still a very recognizable name, so people understand. Mm -hmm. And I've realized, sort of, as the years have gone by, that that's important to me. I kind of don't want to explain, you know, what my company does. Uh, and the other thing, though, that's fun for me is I get to see all our clients. Uh, so I get. To, so the thing I missed about Ford was going around to the plant, but now I get to go to everybody's plants. It's great. I would, <laughs> went up. Uh, I was in Kansas City, and we we supply uh, the workforce for. I was there where they make the pizzas, and then I went to a place where they put me in a cherry picker, 65 feet up in the air, and that was really fun, huh. and saw that. So I still feel connected to our clients' uh, tangible products, and so that's sure. nice. And now I'm also on the board of director of McCormick, so the spice company, and so that's a really nice. I'm, you know, I get to go to their plants. All of their plants are like. They're cute. They're tiny. They just fill bottles full of stuff. <laughs> and I don't tell. Don't tell them I said. <laughs> but um, you know, so that's. So I'm sort of happy though to have that same connection to the consumer uh, that I, I was missing a little bit uh, back from my Ford days. So yeah, it's and it's surprising though. Even though you look at something in in you know serious manufacturing, consumer goods, uh, business services. It's not all that different. You know, the business model's different, but the skills that you bring as a finance person and the interpersonal skills that you bring as a leader and as a developer of people, they are, they, they apply everywhere. It's funny because Patricia talks about the importance of a brand name. And I, I left Ford and BlackRock, this was before the financial services crisis. My parents said, where are you going? I, you know, no. And then everyone that I talked to said, oh, you're going to Blackstone. And I, I said, no, not Blackstone. Even last week, I spoke at a conference, and they introduced me as the CFO of Blackstone. I had to dis tell the <laughs> difference between BlackRock and Blackstone. Um, so it, it's interesting going yeah. from a name that everyone knows to I now think of ourselves as a name that everyone knows, but uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, so, uh, but it's still a business that I love. Yeah. It, it's, um, yeah, it's great. Uh-huh. Actually, kind of to elaborate on what you said, I don't mind our business mostly focused on this asset management. I was wondering how you would elect your business yourself, especially in the crisis, to actually become one of the world's largest financial advisory services well. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, I mean, we are still predominantly asset management um, and manage $3.3 trillion of assets on behalf of our clients. But the foundation of BlackRock, and probably this was about 10 years ago, um, is on a common operating system called BlackRock Solutions, and really the belief that all of our data needs to sit on this one system. There needs to be clear transparency into all the data so that we can look at um, the data across all of our clients and really understand all the risk. Because if everyone is doing something and you're trying to connect it all, it becomes really hard to understand your risk and aggregate risk profiles. And we really needed to be able to value securities. So if we were going to invest, particularly in fixed income securities, which the markets are less transparent than the equity markets, to really be able to value those securities under multiple scenarios. And the whole reason BlackRock got established in the first place was Larry was investing, Larry Fink was investing um, in mortgage-backed securities in the heyday for Credit Suisse and blew, made them lots of money and then blew up. And so back in you know, 1988 or, or whatever said, look, no one should ever blow up. These risks are understandable and you build that on a risk foundation. So then we decided that 
having this as a proprietary tool wasn't really going to allow you to continue to invest in this technology. We said, will this be a proprietary tool, or will it be something that we sell to others? And decided, really, we'll open our technology up becomes a revenue source. Other people can use these tools. Um, and so the clients are big, other asset managers, um, central banks, sovereign wealth funds, big sophisticated. And then when it came to the financial crisis, people had big balance sheets that needed to be valued in, in multiple scenarios. And people wanted someone objectively looking at the value of these securities and not many people had built a system where you could really load this in. And so, you know, all in all, between people using our systems and then us really helping them to value um, complex um, securities, it became a half a billion dollar revenue stream. Um, and, you know, it's not a sidelight. It's because it's the foundation on which the firm is actually run. I think we have time for maybe one more question, if there's, uh-huh. Hi, Josh Jeff on the first year MBA. Um, I find it very unique that both of you were roommates and both being very successful. I'm wondering if, and you already touched on this a little bit, is there a key, uh, key characteristic or was it the fact that you were both in four together and could kind of team your way up? Out, what separates you from your peers or classmates? <laughs> Luck? Uh, maybe all the beer we drank? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel that way. You know, I, but I think, I think probably maybe there is the, some of the reasons that we've been such good friends are probably there were sort of similar types of people and we both are committed to a strong career and put a lot of effort and energy into that. And again, I go back to I think being friends made that easier because you're mutually supporting the decisions that you're making. And when, you know, the thing is that work is hard. I mean, this sounds really silly to say, but, um, and we were talking a little bit about men versus women, and there's too much hot air on this subject, but I, I have a view that one of the reasons that uh, women tend not to get to the levels that Anne Marie and I have is because work is really hard. And there are always times when work is really hard. And men are socialized very strongly that there's not a lot of alternatives but just sticking it out and pushing on through it. And women are socialized that there are a lot of choices, right? And so when you sort of the math of that is that when things are really hard and if you feel like you have choices, you often exercise those choices and it can be hard to get back on the path. You have a strong friendship and it's easier to say, yeah, this really is hard and it's awful and yeah, he is a jerk that you're working for. <laughs> We've had lots of those conversations. Um, and uh, stick with it. And so maybe there is something to be said for uh, the mutual support that we've given each other over over the years. It's funny, we were just talking in the car, we came together from the airport and you know, we, we just talked about ourselves, and I think one of the reasons we get along is we are similar in some ways. And, um, you know, what we, we both joke that we wouldn't be very good, um, let's say, social club moms because yeah. we just don't like doing that. Um, what, so really what, bad. What, I was a bad soccer player. What, what, <laughs> You know, what I really enjoy, I really enjoy solving complex problems. I really like being busy. I, I like working with other people. And I like delivering meaningful results and being challenged to do that. And, you know, I, I think we've always been able to really exchange ideas and collaborate on that. And one of the reasons we get along is I think we, we both like that. We just yeah. like it. And um, I think to be successful, you just have to like what you're doing. If you end up going to a company where you don't like the people or you don't like the work, you're in the wrong place. And don't say, oh, you know, I shouldn't have a career. Just say, I'm in the wrong place. That's I got I mean. to get to a place where I really like the people and I really love what I'm doing every day. And that's, that's what, um, I think that's what helps you to be successful. And I think through the years, we've always encouraged each other in that way. Yeah to do what we like. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, and uh, keep push, pushing hard. 
and you yeah. Know. <laughs> well, I think that that's a really nice positive um, thought to uh, to for us to leave with, and um, uh, I hope that we all uh, are able to take away the. Um, the incredible story, but also, um, you know, the importance of having friends and having someone who will be your rock and help you get through a hard day and say it's a hard day and you can come back tomorrow. And um, and you also both uh, inspire us to continue to aspire to big things. This is a place where I feel like we do a lot of dreaming for two years about what will be, and then um, it's going to be exciting for us to get out there uh, like you, the both of you. So if you all could join me in thanking them for coming back and spending time with us.